<clears throat> decisions, decisions, decisions. Have you actually ever wondered how many decisions, conscious decisions that is, we make in a day? I'm Felipe Manzaducci, I'm uh, Director of Digitization at Skanska UK. And what that means is I'm responsible for uh, digitizing every aspect of what we do. Skanska designs, builds and operates uh, most of the built environment, all the way from uh, rail, highways, infrastructure, all the way to commercial building and residential. We do this in um, select markets, uh, US, the Nordics, and Europe. And in doing so, we have actually become one of the largest uh, construction groups in the world. People, or rather, our people's knowledge is our biggest asset. And we share that knowledge with our customers so that we can create um, great places to live and work. And that makes us unique. That generous kind of uh, attitude towards sharing our knowledge makes us unique because with our customers and our supply chains and our colleagues in the construction sector, we can create long lasting solutions that basically make a better place to live in. And yes, of course, we make decisions. Now, Sheena Lyinga, a researcher at the University of Columbia, she conducted a study and um, the outcome was, on decisions that is, and the outcome was that an adult in a corporate environment, any given day, can make up to 70 decisions. 70 decisions in a day. That means Skanska makes just over two million decisions every single day. So you must be thinking, well, you know, so what? What's so important about decision making? Let me give an example here about this um, industry paper uh, sponsored by the UK government. It was written about 10 years ago, and their view was, if we tell the industry what we want to see, they will make the right decisions to get us to those um, targets. Now, those were the targets. They want to see lower cost in construction. The government wants to see uh, lower emissions during the process of building something. And to be faster at delivering. Well, you all know, the, uh, you know what construction is known for. Late and over budget. So um, how do we make those decisions? Why is decision making important? Because when you start addressing those targets that are external to your organization and bring them in towards internal to you, you can start driving some correlations between, am I making the right decision? Are we making decisions that are gonna make our business long lasting in an environment where that decision is gonna be of use, of purpose? <clears throat> what you see at the bottom is actually our targets, Skanska will work hard and make decisions to reduce lost time accident rates. We don't want to harm anyone in our construction sites. We want to reduce the cost of poor quality. We want to get it right the first time. And we want to reduce embodied carbon that we put in into our construction sites. Because in doing so, in making those right decisions, it will have an impact on our performance. And an impact on our performance will have a direct impact on our customer. And it is through the customer that we directly impact society. So making the right decisions is absolutely critically important for us and for society. So what's the problem? Well, construction industry is known for uh, poor decision making. Uh, we make decisions based on um, bias, uh, personal experience, um, in isolation from actually having the information and the data that you would need to make the right uh, decision. So, again, research in, uh, from Loughborough University shows that, well, it's a case, a sexual case study, 
it showed that up to 40% of the decisions we make on a site are actually unnecessary. Or rather, they should have been made long before you got to that point. So here we are asking some um, site operatives to make decisions in the most uh, difficult circumstances when most of those decisions did, it didn't, they didn't even have to make. It's not down to, them to make, down to them to make those decisions. So not only that, but that case study also uh, identified that the time pressures and the stresses we put onto our site operatives has a huge negative impact on the quality of that decision. Rather chaotic, if you follow my, uh, my, my point. So we're not only asking the right to make the, uh, a lot of decisions, but some decisions don't have to be made, and when we make them, it's so stressful that we make the wrong decisions. So, at Skanska, we truly believe that um, decision-making can actually help us improve our performance. And we believe that by digitizing that decision-making process, we actually can improve the quality of the actual output from making that decision. This graphic represents our digital strategy, which in effect what it shows is that we're designing all our processes to be digital. There's an end point to this. Those three, thir three circles uh, actually represent the three areas where we focus on, on digitizing. That's my job, that's what I do every day. So we digitize our workplaces, what tools we use to make us more efficient back in the office space. We digitize our projects, what kind of automation, robotics, what kind of uh, digital solutions, digital innovation we can throw at project teams so they can become more efficient but ultimately help them make the right decisions. What you see in the middle is actually we focus on bringing um, trusted data. Trusted data that's actually been processed into information, which we actually call business intelligence. Let me show you an example here as to how it works in a construction site. What you see at the bottom is basically data sets. All this data is available to absolutely every single contractor in the UK. It's not ours. It belongs to the supply chain, it's public data, it's accessible data by all. It's how you use that data that makes a difference. Again, we call that business intelligence. We put that into a bit of this kind of you know, big pot of data. And what we do throughout the project is that we use that information, that intelligence, to make decisions right at the beginning of the project, or right at the start of an activity on site. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's happening on site. So we rehearse, we rehearse the hell out of everything. So we practice once, twice, three times, uh, digitally, with all the information necessary to make the right decisions. And it could be we want to reduce carbon, we want to make it safer, we want to be faster. Whatever the decision you're looking for, or whatever the outcome you're looking for, we access that intelligence to make us more, um, to make those decisions better. Once we have decided how we can to deliver that activity or that project in itself, then we, in, we move into the complexity of construction, which is how do we control that as we deliver this project or this activity, we don't go off track. So again, you can use that intelligence, that constant real-time data that we can capture from sites to control that, product, uh, that production rate. And towards the end, once we deliver the project, we can actually look back and think, what decisions did we make that made us more productive? What decisions did we not make that caused a delay in certain areas? And all of this without the bias and subjectivism of uh, commercial contracts. We now can be uh, clear, we can be transparent about what actually happened on a site. We do work, we partner up with um, large tech partners, um, large tech companies, and they do help us to establish this platform, this kind of vehicle whereby we're going to be able to collect all the data, um, capture it, store it, and then somehow 
allow our project teams to consume it. And it's all going well. Um, it sounds easy. I think it's very complex. Creating a, you know, a standard approach, but a best pack approach almost, on how you can achieve that, capture, store, and consume, is harder than it seems. Data lives in different silos. Data ownership is not clearly identified. Construction is very new to data. So, um, but there you have it. You know, we're kind of cracking on with it, making the best of it. And uh, most of these components we actually have in place, which means we can capture data. We can actually translate it into some sort of intelligence, into knowledge, into past experience. And we do have some tools that allow us to consume that information. Then we get into this. We're able then to uh, capture through laser scanning, for example, the quality of our delivery. Is it within tolerance? Have we excavated all the cubic meters that we said we can to excavate? Can we see the flatness of the slab? Is anyone going to come back and challenge us for you know, the fact that it's deviation? And we can even track progress by checking you know, a laser scan against um, something that's been built physically. We also can use data to actually track scheduling and logistics and uh, all sorts of deliveries into our site. Um, lovely colors, great dashboard, and it tells you so much stuff that you begin to lose yourself into it. Or we could actually just use data to monitor our uh, progress. What do we plan against what we've done? I look back as to what, where we are reporting on what has happened. Great tables, great pie chart at the top left. Not bad, is it? Or even cranes. We've got sensors in each crane, so we actually know when the cranes are being used and where they're not being used. All of them looking back in the past, reporting. Great colors again. I actually don't know which one says. It's just some sort of a plan versus actual, yeah, something, you know, some good bars there, some tables. Um, great, another dashboard. Well, hang on, look. Um, this one, uh, we were doing quite well top left and now kind of going bad. Uh, don't know what it is. Uh, some sort of um, plan against plant finish. Um, a look back, I think. A dashboard without a title, how about that? Uh, so I don't know what it is. 67.59%, uh, 59, very important, there's two digits at the end. Um, it's going down, so it's not good. I suppose that's why it's red. Uh, but again, no title, and believe you me, this is a real graphic that we use in a construction site. Oh, and look at this one. Great colors, right? Uh, I chose this one because it's actually portrait. You don't see many portrait ones. So. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So, are we getting this right then? We just said decisions are important. We're making the point that making those decisions is actually really difficult because we're making people under stressed situations make decisions based on nothing, right? Past experience, which, hey, trust me, I've been doing this for 40 years. You've been doing it for, wrong for 40 years. And then we say, well, look, with data, we can actually give them more information. I can make, now they can make better decisions. And we bombard them with dashboards, with a look into the past, with that consideration for the future that they're about to create. I can be controversial, so I don't mind saying this. They are, to me at least, and Skanska is not there. We're not dashboard driven. We don't quite enjoy looking at the past. We enjoy looking at the future. How can we improve our decision making so we make a better future for us, our customer, and society? Yes, we join tech partners to sell us software but I'd much rather get involved with digital innovators. Those companies that actually make 
or rather have a different view, have a vision of what construction could look like and have no fear in making things happen. Lucky for them, they have the investment. So that's why we partner up with them because it means that we don't have to go through the pain of getting some investment to make it happen. And that's what partnership and collaboration is all about. We believe that through AI and machine learning, we can improve that decision making. Don't get me wrong, I don't understand what the graphic actually means. That's not my job. But it's a point being made around if 40% of the decisions that we make on our project side could be made beforehand by having better access to data and information, why don't we? Why don't we allow um, rules, uh, code-driven software to make those decisions for us so that we can actually reduce the number of decisions that we have to make when we get to site? Stop stressing the people on site to make decisions with the wrong information. Let's make it on their behalf beforehand. <clears throat> So this is a way to actually reduce decision-making on our side. Now, how do we improve the quality of that decision-making? Here we have Slate, digital innovators that we believe are about to change how we work in the industry, how we collaborate, and how we access our data to make um, sound decisions, long-lasting for that matter. Now, we have been working with Slate for a few, um, a couple of years now, and we're beginning to understand what actually decision-making means to our business. And it's been through understanding how data and information can be put through a process whereby those decisions can be uh, assisted. So this is about improving the quality of that decision-making. It's about giving decision-makers access to the right information at the right time to make those decisions that are going to have an impact to our project. This is no longer moving towards the future, walking backwards. This is going toward the future, looking forwards. Um, this is actually a, a video that is being put together by Slate. I stand here because I might want to stop it every now and then. And what you see on the screen right now is basically, um, personally, something we fall in love with. This is basically access to real-time information, real-time data as to what is happening on your project site. I've got it here in the palm of my hand. Mobile device. I can actually track and see what's actually happening. And this thing is just telling me, by the way, you have to make a decision. And to make this decision, here is all the information you need. So, for example, uh, just looking at that concrete pour uh, right at the bottom line, and it says you have to make a decision because it's telling you it's there, it's in a little blob. Whoop. Apologies. So you're going to see, so I click on that, and it takes me onto that concrete pour, and it says, well, unfortunately, you cannot make that, uh, that pour. And you say, well, why not? Today, I will have to go right back to the you know, concrete gang, ask a question, what's happening? Why are we running late? Well, we don't know. We're just waiting for someone to tell us what to do. Okay, um, so I have to go back to the site, do some email checking, call a few people. Two hours later, I still have got, I haven't got to the end of it. That concrete pour is not happening. Now the program is being impacted. I've got no time to let people know that that is happening on site, therefore the program is going to be delayed. Now the gang that's supposed to go afterwards to do a bit of, you know, uh, fixing uh, other things on that concrete pour, are going to get there with nothing to do. How inefficient is that, right? Whereas in here, actually, I've got that information right in front of me. And I can see that the, the reason it's not happening is because the, re the rebar process is, um, is taking too long. And it's taking too long because it's raining. No other than that, right? So now I can make a decision on saying, well, do I delay that process? Do I swap it for another process? 
And all, with all of this, you can actually see the impact that it will have on your program. It keeps doing it. I won't stop anymore. And it's not only that concrete pool that we can look at, we can actually look, go back into you know, uh, what happened on the day before, for example, and it can tell you, um, you know, whether that pool was done uh, properly or not. So you can actually uh, capture that cost of poor quality, for example, if there was an issue, and you can tap into it and start learning about what actually happened. Now, the great thing about this is that you're no longer forever having to find that information you remember that data is isolated, that I don't know who the data owner is? Now finally I've got a system that's actually telling me on the spot, this is what the problem is, and this is what the plan was, and this is how it's going off track. So you can make decisions based on that. You can track real time the performance of certain, um, any aspect of the construction site. There you can see another concrete pour that's actually happening. And the great thing is that this data, as I said, doesn't just belong to Skanska. This is data that comes from a supply chain. So you can actually tap directly into their systems and have visibility of how they're performing on your system as well. So it's very, very powerful. And the great thing about it as well is that as it happens, it's taking a record of what you have done. All the decisions you've made are being recorded automatically in the system. Now what this means is you go back to my uh, graphic of the three circles, that cycle of what decisions did we make that made us more productive? I can now tap into them if I belong to another project. Because that business intelligence is being shared all across my business. And the AI component then looks at uh, something they call insights. So what have we done in the past that has led to X, Y, Z outcome? That can actually be explored automatically. That can be shared on the spot. So when I'm doing a rehearsal, I can actually look back in time and say, look, every time we dig a hole, or every time we pour concrete at minus two degrees, we get early cracking. Right, maybe we should stop doing that, right? Believe it or not, we don't have access to all that information uh, nowadays, so we keep making the wrong decisions. It is through digital innovators that we truly believe that we can get to that superhuman decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. That was really thought-provoking. I um, love the idea that now you're learning about decision-making. It's kind of like you're relearning how to make decisions because historically we're, everybody's looking backwards. Uh, and I, kinda, I like history, so I kind of like to say that there are things to be learned from looking backwards. But as you said, to know immediately that the concrete pour isn't happening because of the weather changes the game. So, how is is this? A, is there a there's a uh, sort of uh, sensors as well? Is there, is there a combination of, of of wiring this up to IoT devices? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I agree with you. Looking back is not that bad, is it? Uh, most of the times I look back to see what not to do. Um, but um, but yeah, uh, listen, the construction at least in the UK is in a bit of a um, you know inflection point, and it's all because of technology. So we have better access to technology, we have better understanding of what that technology can do for us. So if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be standing here telling you that we can do things differently. So technology absolutely play, plays a, a key role on that. So from sensors, all the way to uh, digital diaries, um, software that we may use for design and construction purposes, it has advanced at such a level that is allowing us to do things differently. How much money have you wasted in developing dashboards if they're dead? How much money do we keep wasting? <laughs> well, if you say dashboards, dashboards are dead, that, I mean, everybody here in construction has been thinking that dashboards are the future. And, and you know, I think last year we had presentations on well, dashboards. And stop thinking that. Stop thinking that. Uh, a, a dashboard is a glorified Excel spreadsheet. It's actually telling me no information whatsoever dynamically for me to make a decision real time. It simply isn't. And if you believe otherwise, come and find me in a coffee shop and convince me of that. <laughs> but um, it, 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 it doesn't. Um, we have, and we're recording this, we have 
<laughs> over 12,000 dashboards wow. in Skanska UK. Now you're telling me that any of you is going to have the knowledge of knowing where to find that little bit of information on those 12,000 dashboards? I don't believe that for a second. So rather than us having to use you know, our limited brain power to go and you know, shifting through all the uh, dashboards, why don't we instead let you know, um, tools like Slate to do that work for us? You know, so that we can focus on actually making decisions that are valuable based on that information that's coming through us automatically, not having to make that effort. That's what I'm saying with dashboards are dead. We need a dashboard to manage the dashboards. That's, that, that, that's where we're at. Is there any, we're at. any questions for Felipe? Oh, yeah. You, do you want to ask a question, Mr. Payne? No. Uh, how, what are we doing for time? Cause we're good, okay. So um, I'm going to ask you some more questions about Slate. So a couple of years ago, you said you started working with Slate. I guess it was undercover then. And it, did you approach them? Did they approach you? How did, it, how did that start? I'll give my version and then you give your version, <laughs> Richard, okay? Um, it was, uh, it was uh, a coincidental um, uh, cross paths. So uh, we operate in the US and um, we went out there to do, a, you know, uh, as you do, check projects, you know, how you're getting on, learn from each other. And um, uh, Katera back then yeah. uh, turned up and uh, they told us about, you know, how great the world could be. And, um, and we could see behind Katera, we could see, you know, the, the essence of what Slate has become today. So uh, um, it was as easy as a cup of coffee, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a true, a genuine, um, um, I'm going to say parasite relationship mm. uh, in that uh, both uh, bodies enjoy the benefit of each other. And that, I define that as true collaboration when there is an act, you know. But, um, but yeah, I think it was a mutual um, understanding that uh, each organization could su uh, get support from each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, was, was this a Katera technology that you were working This is Richard Harpen from Slate. I'm just going to pass him. Uh, well, I would say just like in any, when you join a company and you try and do something very ambitious, whether it succeeds or fail, you take that learning and then take it on to the next thing you do. So Slate really came together from um, a belief of a group of people, some of whom were in Katera, that there was something very meaningful we could do uh, when we looked at how we used data to make decisions. You know, we'd had the opportunity to work in a, if you saw Michael's presentation earlier, in an environment where we, were, we really didn't have many boundaries. We were encouraged to break things. Um, and yes, we broke a few things. Um, but we also learned a lot of, about what are, what are the levers that are actually going to make a difference. And, and, and it comes down to, I'm not going to repeat what Felipe was saying. It came down to understanding really the power of decisions and what situational context you need to make those decisions. Um, and we looked across other industries, medical, finance, um, to name a few, and saw that what really revolutionized, um, if you like, what transformed those industries was a lot of it to do with the speed at which they make, could make decisions. And anyone who's heard about innovators and disruptors would hear people talk about you know, the speed at which you're able to react to the market, the speed at which you're able to react to a situation is probably going to be the differentiator for you. And so that's really why we had a meeting of the minds. You know? So when we had the opportunity to start a new business that was Slate, um, there were people that uh, innovators, if you like, in companies that we knew of. One of, one of, one of them was Skanska that allowed us to uh, really explore this deeply. And we've been patient. And it's, we haven't tried to do it quickly. We haven't tried to do it slowly either. But there's a lot of work that goes into truly understanding this. And so are you using this on? Uh, oh, 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 Michael Marks has got a question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I really like the way you, you talked about decision making. My question is, and, and this isn't a leading question. I don't know the answer to this one. How do you get a big, complicated organization like yours to adopt a new tool? It's one thing to, for you to see it and go, this would be great, but organizations tend to reject this kind of stuff. So how are you going to get that? Correct. Uh, well, first of all, uh, you have to accept that you will lose your hair in trying. <laughs> um, um, listen, Michael, uh, it, it is hugely complicated. 
Um, we work in very tight margins as main contractors, so um, we uh, tend to be risk adverse. So to make a decision and, okay, let's change the way we do things into something new, you're constantly looking for something that's kind of, is it finished? Is this product something that you can tangibly show me is improving the way I'm going to work? Where's the ROI? Where's the, you know, how long is it going to take to get to that you know, uh, cross of uh, graphic um, in your investment um, portfolio? So it, it's so difficult to do that. And uh, what we've learned through uh, engaging with Slade is that that journey is a journey that the executive team have to go through. So the executive team have to actually understand what is, what is it you're trying to improve? What is it you're trying to change? What, what is broken? What are you trying to do with this new you know, investment? And, um, and that's been the way in which uh, Skanska UK has begun to look at tools like, um, like uh, Slate. Now we're very used to seeing Autodesk, tool on the shelf, license is $100 a month, right? That's how we work, that's how we operate, right? Now can you do a job? Yeah, I can do my job with that. Okay, off you go. So it is ever so challenging, uh, Michael, to, to do that, but uh, our intent and the approach we're taking is let the executive team, let, let the C board actually see what you're, trying, what you're working on. Don't keep it away from them. Don't keep it separate from them. This is as much as their thing as is yours. Um, but again, the construction industry will forever be, well, forever, my lifetime, will be a, a very risk-adverse industry because of the other problems that exist in construction industry, which mm. you know very well, Martin. But then, the, you know, for me, the, the weakest link normally in a, in a digital process is human beings. And uh, so how do you um, proof your, your, your backbone, your, your live system, uh, away from kind of errors made by humans in putting information or or is it completely IOT possible sensing from cameras seeing that the pore is going on and it kind of recognizes that a pore yeah. is going on with Correct. AI Correct. and stuff? Uh, well, if you can get to that point, that'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the reason I call it superhuman decision making is because that decision making is not human anymore. It's an actual, you know, a bunch of systems and computers put together that are making a decision on your behalf. And um, uh, it really strikes me hard, you know, like we make one de conscious decision every 12 minutes. That's a lot. Why don't we remove decision making? Right? Why don't we remove choice in a construction site as much as we can? And, and we can. We've got the systems to allow us to make it happen. So there is a huge human element to this in that sometimes I want to make the decision because I want to get the glory of it. You yeah. know, I want to then... Uh, that decision is easy, I'm going to make, and it positions me, right? So um, that is the kind of human factor that we have to take into consideration. But to date, Martin, I'm yet to meet someone on a site, on a construction site, that says to me, I don't want to use that tool because it makes me better. <laughs> I don't want to use that computer software because you know, I make better decisions. No, 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 I want to keep getting it wrong. I still have to meet that person. So as a final question, uh, what would, uh, I, I don't mean this as a negative, what would old Felipe tell young Felipe as he joined Skanska, as he was joining Skanska now? What, what things would, do you wish you'd known about the construction process and yeah. what, what can be changed <laughs> from your journey so far? That innovation is not within. Not within. Um, a construction industry, focus on what you do, which is dig house and pour concrete. That's what we do. We build stuff, you know, we have a huge impact on society, play your role. But mm -hmm. innovation sits somewhere else. So go and speak up, go and meet other partners, go and find Slate. We should have found Slate, you know, 10 years ago, right? Um, and that is what I would tell. I'm still young, though. I, I know, I know. It's, it's, <laughs> um, it was a theoretically old for Sure, sure. Okay. I think there's a couple of questions. Are there were? Oh, whoop, okay. So you've said that you're using machine learning and AI and um, other industries have taught us that people um, repeatedly make systems with the data that's available rather than the data that they need and then they're 
bad systems, how do you know you've got the right data? We don't. You don't, yeah. We just I don't. <laughs> and, and listen, maybe part of the answer to, you know, how do we convince micro, how do we convince our, you know, our executives that we're doing the right thing? We just don't. We just don't. You've got to close your eyes sometimes and just go, yeah, oh, there you go, I'm still on the stage, you know. And it's so hard when, you know, uh, the, the margins are so low. But, uh, but we have to do it because we know that in doing so, you know, we hugely can improve our performance. So we don't know that's the answer yet. yet. <laughs> so the question was related to evolution rather than revolution, which is right. um, many uh, uh, construction companies use independent subcontractors as the trades. How do you involve, and they are different on each job, uh, so how do you involve how you would like things to work uh, when they're independent companies? Mm. Uh, which is, I think, what Michael was talking about earlier, but mm. uh, um, that, that's surely a key. Oh, he, he wants me to speak louder. No, I, but, I got here but, anyway. But I thought I was speaking louder sure, now. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was loud and clear. Um, um, so I'm just trying to frame the, 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 the question again. I got sidetracked with the loudness of the voice. How do you deal with subcontractors? That's it. Um, uh, uh, exactly. It, it, it's, uh, uh, take, take the platform approach. You, know? uh, you have to, as main contractors, we're enabling subcontractors to come and do the great stuff that they do, right? We just make sure that all the, all, the, all, the, all the pieces of puzzle are in place, orchestrated, and make sure that they deliver something good for the customer. That's the role we play. We'll take the risk and we'll charge you for it. But um, so if you enable that platform for all the subcontractors to play in that you know, constrained or that kind of protected you know, sandpit, for them to work and collaborate together and for, for that end goal, that's what we do, see? So the subcontractor should not have to, you know, um, retrain or kind of, you know, they shouldn't have to buy licenses that, you know, we're getting, that we're getting as well. Uh, that's, not the, that's not our game, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to integrate the efforts so that the output is what the customer's asking for. That's what we do. So by having a platform, that enables that, and I think that's what Slate is you know, uh, heading towards. There you go, guys, you've you got, you got this platform you can work with, you know, just uh, information and data will flow through it and help you make the right decisions. If we can get all subcontractors to engage on that platform, we're laughing. One last question. What's your view of Skanska's, the proportion of Skanska's projects that are DFMA, off-site construction? How do you see that changing in the future? Do you, uh, you know, What's the current percentage of on-site construction versus off-site, and how, how do you see that change in the yeah. next 10 years? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so, and, and uh, just so you know, my remit is also MMC and innovation in Skanska UK, so I've got a lot to say about this, but I'll be brief. So, um, in Skanska, we are pushing for MMC. We're taking that as, as the strategic level at the moment, and the investment we're making is about you know, developing a process that allows project teams to make decisions on um, what, su what supplier I can go to that could deliver some sort of a, you know, package using a modern mess of construction offsite mainly. We have taken that uh, approach in a number of projects internally. And uh, most recently, a couple of years ago, we finished year 14 and we could see um, on that project took it on uh, quite strongly, and we were delivering, um, you know, that project was delivered 20% off-site, which was quite impressive, being that it was uh, a highway, right? Who would have thought? So, um, so yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's what we're doing um, regarding MMC, but the journey is very long. Uh, DFMA, I think, as a concept, is absolutely... Uh, the way to go because it taps into many other areas that are important to the construction industry. And, uh, and again, I think technology is going to allow us to uh, get there faster, move there faster. But, um, but I think that's another, that's another topic for another but, day. But you think that a proportion of nearly every project moving forward will have some off-site construction? It's happening already. And when you look at you know, the, um, the you know, big documentation, 
uh, a request is that you demonstrate how you're going to be doing things off site. 10% of this package has to be done off site. So, uh, not just us, but our customers are beginning to be a lot more uh, savvy about the opportunity that MMC can bring to the industry. So, um, by obligation almost, we have to, if you want to win the work, you have to bring on the MMC. So, um, yeah, we, we not, it's not something that we put into the side, it's something we're actively working on. Thanks, Felipe, and thanks for driving in today. That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.